Today's topic is tongue ties. This is a controversial topic that has been an interest of mine for several years after my wife and I did a tongue tie release uh, for my oldest daughter. After seeing how she changed, I ended up getting my tongue tie released as well after realizing that I had one. It was a profound experience that changed way more throughout my body than I had originally expected. And since then, I've tried to understand anatomically how a tongue tie can cause so many changes. I'm your host. I'm, my name is Dr. Daniel Lopez. I'm an osteopathic physician that practices osteopathic manipulative medicine at Osteopathic Integrative Medicine in Lakewood, Colorado. My guest today uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree in dental hygiene from Eastern Washington University. She subsequently became interested in the tongue and how the health of the mouth directly relates to the overall health of the body. And she, she opened up her myofunctional therapy practice called Faceology in Seattle in 2010 and took the entire practice online in 2014, becoming the world's fully the, the world's first fully online myofunctional therapy practice. One of her passions is to spread and create awareness about myofunctional therapy. She's appeared on the High Intensity Health podcast, Cognitive Rampage podcast, and is a regular contributor, contributor to askthedentist.com. She's from the Pacific Northwest and currently lives in Hawaii where she consults with patients, doctors, and other healthcare providers from all over the world. So. I want to welcome Sarah Hornsby here today on the show with me. Hello. Thanks for such a nice introduction. That was really good. <laughs> You're welcome. So let's jump to it. So tell the audience a little bit about yourself. How did you get to doing oral myofunctional therapy? Yeah, it's, I, I guess it, it didn't start off as a, you know, a, a passion for me because I didn't know about it. Like most people in the dental field, we don't really learn about tongue ties and tongue thrusts and all of these oral myofunctional issues that I work with every day now. We don't really learn that in school. Um, orthodontists don't, dentists don't, pediatricians don't, ear, nose, and throat doctors don't. And these are all professionals who work in this area. So I started off like any other dental hygienist and I got my first job and I liked it. Patients liked me. I, you know, I thought it was a, a great job to begin with, but I started thinking, you know, maybe there's more to some of these things. So fast forward about a year um, of cleaning people's teeth and, you know, giving injections like we do in Washington state. Um, I really found myself in a place where I just felt like I don't want to, I don't want to hurt people. I don't like causing people pain and to be a good hygienist. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to hurt people. So um, I looked for how do I um, transition and use my skills as a dental hygienist? How do I apply that to other areas? So I looked into a bunch of things and almost by accident, I found out about this training course in a field called oral facial myofunctional therapy. And I was like, what the heck is that? I've never heard of it. I'm brand new out of school. I have like the latest and greatest information. So I should have heard about this stuff. So maybe it's not a real thing, but I'm going to check it out anyways. So I took this course and while I was sitting in the course getting trained um, to help people with these weird myofunctional issues that I had never heard of, I was sitting there realizing I had a lot of the symptoms myself. So um, we could get more into what those symptoms are. But yeah, I don't think I would have actually thought the field was a real thing, except that I was dealing with the stuff myself. And that course that I was sitting in was what really pointed it out to me. So I would say, you know, if I went back and thought about it now, I was probably in a little bit of denial. But overall, um, it's really what led me to keep going in this field where most people didn't know about it. And it was really it was a struggle to get started in a field that's just not well known. And especially around that time, like the economy was crashing and there was just so much going on, um, you know, in 2010 and people weren't really looking at the tongue um, right. like they are today. It's totally different. Yeah. I think when you don't understand something, it's easy to be a little bit skeptical at first. And yeah, I was definitely. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's go over like, what do, oral myofunctional therapists do then? Like, like a little more yeah. background into that I think would be helpful. Yeah, it's a good question because like I said, most people have never heard of this field. Most people don't know what it is and not just 
you know, regular people out there, most medical and dental people have never heard of it either. So I basically teach people exercises for their mouth. So it's a lot like physical therapy. Um, I teach people, you know, I say, here's five exercises, go do these at home. Um, some of it, which we'll get to more, is is kind of like rehab, like um, the tongue tie post-surgical exercises are very much um rehab oriented like a physical therapist would um, a lot of the other exercises are more preventive and um, yeah basically i teach people exercises um, those exercises are very simple they're things that we should all do naturally we shouldn't need a therapist for these things um, i basically teach people four main things um, nasal breathing something we should all do all day and all night. Um, I teach lip seal, so how to rest with your lips together. I teach proper tongue placement, so your tongue should be resting fully in the roof of your mouth, filling up the entire oral cavity. Um, and I teach proper swallowing patterns. So these things are things we should all do naturally the right way. And for whatever reason, which we can get into more later, um, some people don't like me and like a lot of others out there. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically what I teach. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right. So then who is your ideal client? I mean, what what kind of person comes to see you? I mean, is it kids? Is it adults? Yeah. Is it, uh, and what kind of problems do they have? Yeah, um, that's a good question, too, because a lot of people like me didn't realize they had these issues. So um, most people who come to me and they have learned that they have myofunctional or oral myofunctional problems, um, usually they have pretty bigger picture issues that it's hard to really trace back down to the mouth. So um, a lot of the adult patients I see have sleep apnea. Um, they have chronic TMJ pain, t uh, clenching, grinding, headaches, um, lots of head and neck issues. Um, most have allergies. Most have trouble breathing through their nose. And the thing is that I think most people don't realize it and why um, it takes a while for us to figure these things out is it starts so subtle. So I tell people every day that kids who breathe through the mouth are the adults who end up with sleep apnea. So mouth breathing and tongue position is completely interconnected and that's where the tongue tie comes into everything. Um, so yeah, I would say most of my patients are adults, honestly, um, maybe 60%, about 40% are kids, but it's never too late to do this therapy. Anyone can benefit at any age. In an ideal world, we would all figure this stuff out when we were kids. So that way, as we grow and develop into adults, um, our facial structures would, would develop and, and grow properly. So um, it's better if you can get the therapy done for a six-year-old than it is for a 36 or 46-year-old, but it's not too late. Well, I can tell you that I did mine in about two years ago, and my only regret was that I didn't do it 30 plus years ago. And I also even I sent my mom to have it done. And honestly, when she was done, she said, she was like, I feel like I can stand up straight for the first time in my life. So there was yeah. a lot of interesting changes, you know, and, and I think definitely for adults, like it's not, uh, it's, it's not too late and it, it should be something that, uh, mm -hmm we should be more mindful of. And, and, but unfortunately I think there's still a lot to learn from, from our perspective. Oh gosh, there's a ton, there's a ton of information we don't know. And I'm curious, what were your symptoms? Like what were the first things that you noticed that made you even start looking into this stuff? Well, in, from it, my story kind of goes back to like, we did it for, for my daughter and initially my, That's right. mm -hmm. my wife was like, well, you know, she's tongue tied. And I was kind of like, well, what the heck is that? You know? And, and so I started l learning a little bit about it and, uh, you know, and I could tell that, you know, because she had an issue latching, like uh, that seemed to be one of the hallmark symptoms for, for babies and, and things like that. And then when my wife went back to work, uh, you know, my mom was helping us with, with the baby and, and she couldn't drink out of a bottle. And even though she was mm -hmm. actually a very large baby, she, uh, so we knew that, the pediatrician wasn't going to recommend uh, her having a tongue, her tongue tie released, but I mm. made an appointment with an ENT and, and had her, had watched her get it done. And I watched her latch immediately before then the doctor came in, did the procedure. I mean, it took probably five seconds, honestly. And then, yeah, it's easy in babies. Oh, I should say easy. It's yeah. pretty quick. <laughs> Yeah, and then watched her latch right afterwards, and I was amazed because her whole, her whole face changed. It was like her face mm. expanded, her upper lip turned pink, uh, and then she could also open her jaw wider. And so, 
that really just drew my attention because of the work that I do working on people's heads and cranial bones often. It just, mm. uh, to me, it, it was like, okay, is this something I need to be paying attention to for adults? But I couldn't find any information. And I was like, well, I need to find somebody maybe who would be a willing mm. guinea pig. And then later realized that I was tongue tied and that uh, I was like, well, I want to try it to see if it's going to help me. And, and honestly, like af as soon as it was done, even when my mouth was numb, I could tell that my windpipe was more open. It was easier to mm. breathe. My whole face had relaxed. My neck uh, had changed. It was more mobile, even though I didn't necessarily feel like I had neck issues before that. And then later also noticed, you know, my, my chest relaxed, my low back, uh, yeah. Less, you know, a lot of a lot of symptoms that I would have never expected. And so uh, it, it really was an, a profound experience. And I think in the right cases, it, it, it's, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I've heard, I don't want to say there's, um, what's that called, a backlash. Um, but I've been hearing lately because tongue ties, I would say in the past, I've noticed a huge like paradigm shift in the past 18 months, probably, right. where a lot of people are looking at this. But before then, there wasn't, I mean, I was like crazy for telling people they needed their tongue tie release. You know, people thought, uh, I don't know what's what's going on with that idea. But it sounds really scary to a lot of parents when you recommend that you need to like cut underneath your child's tongue, you know. So right. as it's becoming more of this mainstream idea, um, I've been hearing, oh, that's just the flavor of the week, you know. Um, right. Everybody's jumping on that bandwagon. And I think, I don't think that's true. I think we finally have the awareness about the tongue that it's it's deserving so um just because we didn't look at it before didn't mean it didn't exist right so right well i think you know one way that i approach it that i i mean at least it works for adults when i when i treat them is i actually manually treat their tongue when they are tongue-tied and show them even even just getting a small release often they start to feel a big change in their neck head things like that and they they feel these body changes and and so they, they're often a lot more, uh, I, I think, th th it's easier for them to realize at that point that the tongue yeah. has a, a big effect on them. But let's go into yeah, definitely. what exactly is a tongue tie? Because Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so we all have a frenum or a frenulum underneath our tongue. It's that band of, it's like, it looks like a line. I'm sure you've seen it. You know, if you've looked in your mouth for anyone who's listening and you looked under your tongue, you're going to see um, the frenum. And for some people, this is too short or too tight and it limits their mobility. So they're not actually able to um, get their tongue to rest properly inside their mouth. So from my perspective as a myofunctional therapist, that tongue posture is critical. Um, and there's, you know, the reason we got in touch was because uh, the role of the tongue was swallowing and um, I saw your article on, on the orbits of the eye and vision. So um, it goes a long way, um, the, this whole tongue thing. But basically, if you're tongue tied, you've got a bound down tight tongue and whether it affects just the posture or the movement of the tongue, um, it's causing problems for jaw growth and development in kids. Um, I hear from a lot of parents who say, well, my kids don't have speech issues, so the tongue tie shouldn't matter, right? And and I say, well, not really, because um, it's good if they don't have speech issues, but, you know, having that tongue tie, that restriction underneath their tongue, it's basically like you can think of it as um, like a really bad knot in your shoulder. Like if you're getting a massage and you have like just this bad knot that needs to be worked out, it's like that, but way worse. It's an anatomical midline defect that's... Um, connected, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but I'll just share it. Um, it's connected to a very specific gene mutation, that MTHFR gene. So um, I do not pretend to be an expert about that, but I know that it is hereditary. It's passed down. So oftentimes, like you experienced with your daughter, um, parents discover their tongue tied because their babies have trouble feeding or speaking or things like that. So right. um, yeah, that's, I guess, a long version of what it is. <laughs> yeah, I think the way I end up describing it to people too is um, I tell them, you know, when, when we develop embryologically, you're, you know, your hands start out webbed and, mm -hmm. and then that webbing, you know, those cells die out until they reach down to this point. And when you have a defect, like a tongue tie is like having the webbing there. And then mm -hmm. rather than it receding all the way, it ends up receding partially. 
And what that, you know, imagine if your fingers were then webbed and stuck, you wouldn't be able to move them so well. And the more you use your hand, the more fatigued it would get. And it might cause yeah. you some forearm pain and shoulder pain and things like that. And the, and the tongue is, in a sense, the same, except that the tongue is connected to a lot more things and ultimately Definitely. use it a lot more when you're speaking, you're swallowing, you're breathing. We're all doing that all the time. And the more you use it and the more it's bound down, the harder and more fatigued it gets. And that causes a lot of problems. For sure. Yeah. Tons of problems. And uh, I think, um, oh, I see that question popped up there. Um, I, d I missed what it said. You can read it, though. I'll I can try to answer it if you want. But um, yeah, I think when people see it as a birth defect, even if it's a minor one, um, it's not, I, I guess I've had some people question me and say, well, I thought you weren't really into doing surgeries because typically I'm not. Um, so why would you recommend a tongue tie surgery? And, you know, to me it is, it's like, well, if your child had web webbing between their fingers, you would see the need to have that webbing released, right? I mean, I, I think I would. Right. Um, so I think it's a good way to think about it like that. Um, but yeah, you can go on with the the question or. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about. I mean, are there different classifications for tongue ties? I mean, I've heard of anterior, posterior, and all that. And how do you know or tell the difference? Exactly? Yes, <laughs> this is kind of a big mess. So there's not one like standardized um, exam for doing tongue tie measuring. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why the field is a bit controversial is because. Everyone has their own version of what they think a tongue tie is, and and that can vary um, significantly. It doesn't mean that the tip of your tongue is like fully connected to the floor of your mouth. There's a spectrum of tongue ties. So some people are going to be more severe. Some people, I, I honestly look at their tongue, and I think, gosh, it doesn't look like they're tongue tied, but they've got all of these symptoms, and they fit into maybe not the 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 visual version of a tongue tie that we can all look at and say, oh yeah, that's a problem. But right. they've got these these symptoms that tell me there's restriction. And that's where the word um, posterior comes in. So if you think of the tongue like a, a three-dimensional, I don't know, like a, a tube or something, um, that, that frenum runs like a a partition down the length of the tongue, like down, like in deep internally. So if in the anterior portion, it looks fine, it doesn't mean there's nothing restricting the back portion of the tongue. So um, those are hard to identify. And a lot of times, if I see somebody that have those symptoms and their tongue looks okay, I'll often say, you know, let's do a few um, therapy sessions before we make the call on whether or not you need surgery. There is a lot you can do, probably what you're doing with your patients. Um, there's a lot you can do with just muscle exercises and movements and even releasing underneath the tongue to help it get more mobility. So. Yeah, I know, I know from my perspective, one of the things that I've been looking at recently, I kind of came across this uh, and I, I just wrote an article about it, but and, and I don't know how accurate it is at this point, but it made sense to me in terms of anatomically and all that. But a way for for people to tell that potentially if they do have a tongue tie is to actually arch their back and look up and then with their mouth closed, try to swallow. Oh, yeah. And if they're tongue tied, their hyoid bone is actually going to get pulled down. And so when they're looking up, it's not going to be able to come up and rise when they try to swallow. So they won't be able to do it. And I, I, I think that is a way to, 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 to uh, look at it. Oh, I like that. I've never heard of that. So you'll have to send me that link or we can talk about yeah. it later. But that's a that's a, a cool test. Yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that. The other thing that I realized was, you know, it's part of it is how people are looking at tongue ties. So often when people you know, I, I know when I had my phrenectomy, what they were doing was, you know, pulling it out, looking how far you could stick out your tongue or pulling it straight up. And what I realized was if you if you pull the tip and open your mouth straight up, like it only shows a certain portion of it. And, and I think what yes. what matters to me is the back of the tongue. And in order to expose that, you actually have to get your fingers in there or like some kind of forked device and lift the whole tongue blade up. And then you can see like what in a sense, like you would see like that whole portion that is still lingering in the back there. And, yeah. and I feel like that's not necessarily the way it's generally been being looked at. And that's why it's hard to see because I noticed that with mine and, and it took me a while to realize that, oh, I'm still tongue tied. And it was because I couldn't swallow it. And I was excited because I was like, okay, I'm going to show my wife, you know, what it's like to be for people who aren't tongue tied, uh, 
what it's like to be tongue tied. And so I told her, I was like, Hey, try this, you know, and, and you'll see what it's like to be tongue tied. And so she mm -hmm. arched her back and look up, looked up and mm -hmm. she swallowed and she looked at me and was like, what's the big deal? And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, maybe that's not showing you what it's like to be tongue tied, it's showing me that I'm still tongue tied. So. Um, yeah. And if you think about what's happening to those muscles when they're being bound down by that restriction, um, a lot of the muscles in our throat and all underneath the jaw, all around the TMJ complex, um, the back of the tongue, a lot of those muscles are just completely offline. So um, that's where myofunctional therapy really comes in. Um, a lot of people um, now that they're learning about tongue ties, they're thinking, oh, I need to go get this released. But what they don't realize is just having it released, that's like the very tip of the iceberg. You really got to work on um, either working with someone like me, um, a myofunctional therapist or oral myofunctional therapist. Um, cranial sacral therapist can do releases. Cranial osteopaths like you can do a lot of releases that go along to help get those muscles to actually go where they need to go because you can release it like the physical surgery um, but it's got to maintain or it's you're you have to learn how to use and rest your tongue differently so right. um, that's where a lot of the stuff that that I teach comes in um, because those muscles are just they're like dormant or atrophied or offline whatever you the correct terminology is they're not working and um, you know people need to get get those muscles working yeah, absolutely. So let me think. I've I've heard, I know people have been critical. I've heard criticisms about tongue ties, you know, because people are getting in, in certain places. I feel like, you know, certain people are saying, well, everybody's getting it. And again, like you were saying, kind of a flavor of the month thing. Yeah. But then their, their argument is, you know, I, I thought only 5% of the population had tongue ties. Mm -hmm. So, uh you know, from my perspective, I've always wondered, like, well, if we're still having such a hard time diagnosing it, how are mm -hmm. you very, how are you sh certain that that 5% number is correct? But anyway, That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, um, I've heard the same statistics, 5%, which is, I mean, that is kind of high if you think about it, one in 20 people. Um, right. That makes sense. I mean, that, that seems like a, a reasonable number, but, you know, there are dentists who've told me, oh, you know, these myofunctional therapists, they're just saying that everyone's tongue tied. So um, I don't know if that's true or not. But, uh, you know, as far as like the prevalence, um, I think it's more that we're seeing it now versus before we weren't seeing it. So maybe, yeah. um, maybe that's it. I'm not sure. Do you have any theories on that? <laughs> well, I just feel like we're understanding it more, like in terms mm -hmm. of how to diagnose, this, diagnose it and everything like that. My suspicion is the 5%. And I don't know where that number again came from either. Could have been, you know, for example, kids that had speech issues or, or things like mm -hmm. that, you know, and mm -hmm. but you're not really looking at the subclinical tongue ties or maybe I don't know if they were looking at babies that had latching issues or things like that. But, yeah. but I and, feel like and, I see that a lot more regularly, like uh, at least the, a lot of the people that I see are tongue tied. Mm -hmm. But I also don't know if the, that's because the population that I get are, you know, people who have a lot of issues related to that and those are the people yeah. that me. and that's the the f same flaw that i have you know it does seem like wow all these people are tongue-tied um but you know that's that's why they're looking for someone like me or like you because they're having these head and neck issues and they can't figure it out and then you know they start questioning a lot of these things like is it my breathing is it my tongue is it my whatever, you know, what's happening with my TMJ. So yeah, we see out of the general population, we're seeing people much more likely to have these issues too. So that, that plays a role too. Yeah. And then I think, I mean, in terms of the prevalence, and I think you talked about it earlier was the, the MTHFR gene mm -hmm. defect, which, you know, the, for a lot from, I'm also not an expert on that, but I know it, it does lead to a lot of midline defects. And that would make mm -hmm. sense to me that the frenulum, uh, frenulum is not then able to uh, recede completely as a mid midline mm -hmm. defect, and that's how I see it. And the MTHFR defect, I mean, I've, uh, according to the, the statistics that I've seen, is a lot more prevalent than 5%. Mm -hmm. So there's also potentially that issue. And and that, yeah. you know, again, we could be having some subclinical tongue ties that are a lot more uh, prominent than that 5% number we've initially uh, seen. So, yeah. And we're both seeing people with symptoms. Um, I do meet, you know, usually it's like the, 
<laughs> this is kind of like stereotype people, but usually it's the wife who reaches out to me and right. says, Hey, my, I think my husband is tongue tied. Um, and the husband is like, well, I don't have, I don't have any problems. I don't have sleep apnea. I don't have jaw pain. I don't have headaches. And so at that point I do say to people, you know, if you don't have any symptoms, I mean, technically, I would just say you're okay, but we don't know if you don't correct that tongue tie today. We don't know what's going to happen a year or five years or 10 years down the line. So, you know, it's not everybody has the symptoms that would make them even seek out um, right. someone like you or me. So, yeah. And, and when I say subclinical, I mean, I, I don't know that that's the correct term. I mean, it's more like being able to link maybe a person's symptoms because they could be having neck mm -hmm. pain and back pain and things like that. And they, and and you're right. They're and they're like, oh. Mind. But you would, you know, most people aren't going to be like, well, I have, you know, I have headaches and I have neck pain because my tongue is tied, you know, that kind of thing. So. <laughs> most people will not think that. It takes, I, I find that the people who, who actually reach out to me, they've spent a ton of time researching and trying things and tons of trial and error, meeting with tons of dentists and doctors who, you know, didn't notice it. And that that's not saying that they're like bad doctors and dentists. Um, right. Like I said, in the very beginning, um, most of us aren't trained on this stuff. I mean, it's very rare that you actually have a dentist who right out of dental school is screening for tongue ties. I don't think that's happening. I mean, I hope that starts happening in the future. But um, yeah, it's not the, the mainstream um, way of looking at the mouth. So right. Well, I guess that's a good way to kind of segue into the next question, which I guess is mm -hmm. you know, what kinds of effects uh, do you see from adults who are tongue tied? Because I, I know we've talked a, a good amount about that, you know, but. Yeah, um, the effects, I mean, dentally, it it does have an effect. People um, tend to have smaller mandibles. They tend to have um, narrower palates or small, shallower palates, smaller mouths, um, more crowding to their teeth. Um, looking at the head and neck, tongue tied people tend to have a much worse, um, I guess, risk of having that forward head posture, um, which of course then makes your shoulders rolled. So it's it's this ripple effect of the the tongue. I think there's there's many layers here happening with tongue ties, but basically um, there's the tension factor, there's the compensation factor, um, you know, uh, different muscle groups having to compensate, and then um, there's the the growth and development factor. So as kids who are tongue tied grow into adults they're actually developing compromised like bone structures. And right. that sounds dramatic, but it's really not. Um, if, if your tongue is not able to um, maintain the, the space of the oral cavity, um, you're gonna end up with narrow palate, smaller jaws and crowded teeth. And, and that's because the tongue is supposed to be there to, to guide the growth of the face in kids as they age. So um, it's, it's a big deal. So I see a lot of adults with dental issues and then all those other things that we mentioned, which leads to sleep apnea. It's it's really like that's the next progression. If you've got these small compromised structures, the the muscular uh, issues and, and the habits that go along with that, like mouth breathing, um, it's a recipe to give you sleep apnea at some point in your life. So um, sure. that's, you know, that those are all the things that that, that people that I see um, have or have experienced. So, um, yeah, <laughs> those are the effects, I guess. Right. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I tend to completely agree. I mean, I think a lot of people notice their face relaxing and things like that. The only other places, the other places that I've seen changes are uh, in the arms, extremities. And I think that has to do with the, the tongue being attached oh. to a small horseshoe shaped bone here called the hyoid bone. And uh -huh. the hyoid bone has the two fascial layers. Fascia is a connective tissue throughout the body and two fascial layers. It's the superficial and middle cervical fascia attached onto the hyoid bone. So if the tongue is is tied, it tends to pull up on that hyoid bone, which mm -hmm. pulls up essentially your trachea and I think your esophagus as well, but also pulls on that fascia. And and so that fascia continues on to the fingertips and, and, mm. and it's there. So uh, I've, I've noticed people's arms relax, you know, and things like that, but then- Oh, that's interesting. They get that forward posture is because as their trachea gets pulled up, it's all actually anchored down lower. Like if you think about their mm -hmm. their, their lungs are anchored down to their diaphragm yes. um, through a ligament. And so that's much stronger than up here. So if all this tenses up and contracts, you're gonna get pulled down like that. You know, that this is weaker up yeah. here. That's that makes perfect sense to be in. And that is a realm I don't know about, you know, the, yeah. the rest of the body. Um, I'm so fascinated by the effects that the tongue 
and all of this fascia that it does connect the whole deep front line, right? So yeah. um, I've I've been lucky to kind of have the chance to to um, discuss the effects of the tongue and all of these things um, with someone. I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name is Naudi Aguilar. He does something mm -hmm. called functional patterns. Um, it's really interesting, and and I'm just like I'm a noob. I don't know anything about it really, but um, it's really interesting. I've been having conversations with him about all of these things, and I wouldn't be surprised if somebody who knows this functional pattern stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if eventually they find a way to release the tongue through fascia and all of these exercises and maybe some of the things you do without having the actual surgery. So I don't think that exists yet. And I don't honestly know if it's possible, but if anyone can figure it out, it's probably one of these functional patterns people. So sure. hopefully they do. I'd like to know if you can do it non-surgically, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd certainly would prefer to do it that way, but I haven't myself figured that I out. I know. I don't know either. I wish I had the answers to that, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you from my perspective, at least I, I can release it for, or release the people's tongue and it can feel better. But when mm -hmm. they have that tongue tie, the more they use it, eventually, which again, yeah. people talk mm -hmm. all the time, they swallow mm -hmm. all the time and they're always breathing. So the tongue just, the more they use it, the more fatigue they get. Mm -hmm. and so it, it yeah. can, lead back to going reverting back to that pattern for that reason and so i i haven't quite figured it out if i ever do i'll certainly please let me know yeah i i would love to know if there is a way that either through um, myofacial release or exercises or some of these um, full body exercise, you know, I focus on such a small um, portion of, of the mouth and face and head and neck that um, i know there's a lot more out there so i often will tell people you know these things, our whole body's connected. You know, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to do these exercises right here and everything's going to be solved. There's a, there's a big picture to it, but, you know, it's connecting all the dots and I at least have one of the puzzle pieces, but um, there's a lot, lot more to it. Yeah, definitely. So mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective, like how does someone know if they have a tongue tie and then yeah. where would they go or how do they, how can they know if, go to get diagnosed or where can they go to get diagnosed? Yeah. And this, I think, is hard for people. Um, if you suspect you have a tongue tie um, because you have some of the symptoms like headaches, clenching and grinding, um, TMJ problems, um, chronic head, neck, shoulder fatigue, pain, um, that forward head posture or sleep apnea, any of these things that we've both been talking about, those could be signs that you do have an undiagnosed tongue tie. Now getting somebody to actually recognize that and help you with it can be more challenging. Um, like I said, the field is growing and the paradigm around this stuff is changing, but um, you can still go to like, I would say 100 dentists out there and ask about a tongue tie or myofunctional therapy, what I do. And maybe one or two will say, oh yeah, we can take care of that. Here's exactly how it works. Here's why it matters. It's still, <laughs> it's still hard. So I would say do your research. Um, I mean, that's why I offer free assessments when I work with people. Sometimes people just have questions. They just wanna know, do I have a tongue tie? So, um, you know, find a myofunctional therapist, oral myofunctional therapist out there, um, someone like me or someone like you who, um, I would say who's got lots of information, you know, check out websites. Um, most dentists don't know. Most pediatricians don't know about this stuff. So um, it takes a little digging. But if you know what to Google and eventually, you know, you'll figure it out. Yeah, definitely. I wish it was easier, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I feel like I've even after having my phrenectomy, I mean, later I realized I was still tongue tied. I was like, okay, how can I diagnose this more clearly or figure it out? And, and so that's kind of been my journey. Yeah, it's tricky. It's mm -hmm. been trying to, trying to realize, okay, I have a whole bunch of frenulum still stuck back there that is affecting mm -hmm. my tongue still. And yeah. And, and the tongue tie is just one of many ties, I guess this, this yeah. group, you'll, you'll hear a term out there, um, tethered oral tissues, um, right. TOTS, uh, there's lip ties and there's even buckle ties. So some people are really into releasing all of those. Um, the lip ties are the, like, I would say number two priority for me. I rarely talk about the buckle ties, but, um, the lip ties can, I think definitely affect breastfeeding and babies for sure. So, um, getting the, those lips to flange out, you know, like open more, if they're restricted down, babies are going to struggle with feeding. So, yeah. um, of course that has carryover effects into, you know, children and adults, but I, I think that's the, the biggest thing um, for breastfeeding, especially. Okay. 
Well, and then let's say someone is tongue tied, whether it's a baby or an adult, what, what should they do about it? Like, what are the options? Um, the go-to thing is that, you know, surgery I've been referring to. So it's usually called a phrenectomy, a phrenotomy, phrenulectomy. It, the terminology varies, but um, typically it's a very easy, very quick procedure, even for adults. Um, most of the time, I would say it takes five to 15 minutes. Um, and what they do is they either use a laser or scissors or a scalpel and sutures, and they release um, or you know, surgically um, take care of, for lack of a better word, um, that frenum. So depending on the technique, whether it's a laser or scalpel and sutures, um, they're letting that tight band of tissue go. So they call it a tongue tie release. Um, yeah. Like I said before, I hope at some point we have a way of manually doing it, um, but I, I don't honestly know if that's possible, but you know, there's, the, you never know. Um, that procedure for me, when I work with people, um, I want people to do exercises before they have the procedure done. And I usually recommend three or four weeks of exercises prior to actually having that tongue tie release. Then there's post exercises that help with the healing and the new, um, you know, those those dormant muscles I was telling you about how to activate those and right. to, you know, swallow, eat, speak, all of these things, rest your tongue properly. So um, the before and after, I think, is a piece that it's just now getting looked at. I'm hearing more and more of the the dentists and ENTs who do the releases. More and more, they're starting to say you have to work with a myofunctional therapist. Um, that used to never happen, and now I hear it um, quite a bit. And I think, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, at least that tells me that there's changes happening and there, the awareness is growing a ton. So, right. Well, I know yeah. I've had a phrenectomy twice, and I can definitely say that you know it was a very uh, I don't want to say it was completely painless, but at the same time, I, after I had it, I never ended mm -hmm. up taking any pain medications like ibuprofen mm -hmm. or anything like that. And it never changed the what I ate. I mm -hmm. never changed my ability to speak. I mean, I felt like it was pretty sore for about a week or so. And then after that, uh, I mean, it really was never that bad. Uh, recently, I interviewed somebody else out in Singapore, a patient who just had it done, and I'd never met her previously, but we, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I just wanted it, her to talk about her experiences and I, I put that on my Facebook page. So if you want to look for it, it's, it's I'll look great. at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. when you had yours done, was it a laser or what was the, yeah, like what the technique laser, was it? So with the laser, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't, it didn't require any stitches or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I have heard that there are some ways to do it that like when they don't do it with the laser, sometimes they do need stitches and things like that. But I, I like the laser because, yeah, uh, you know, without the stitches, there really wasn't any need for any follow up with the dentist or anything after that to have them removed or anything like that. So I felt like it was just a simpler process. But it is simple. And I find that even this is like a divided camp between people, um, you know, laser or no laser, you know, laser or sutures and scalpel. So um, I tell people just go with the experience of the doctor, you know, find right. someone who does this a lot and who's good at it and who, um, you know, doesn't do one or two a month or a year. You want somebody who does these releases regularly, like daily. So to me, yeah. the technique doesn't matter as much. Um, but there's a new um, technique that's kind of been started if you're interested in looking up someone else. Um, Dr. Sarush Zaghi. Have you heard of him? Mm -mm. He's out of Los Angeles. He's got videos of all of these things um, on his YouTube channel. And he's doing this new technique where um, it is, I mean, I've had patients who've done it and who've done the laser. And I do think it's a little bit more painful, um, but the success and the reattachment rates um, are much lower and he's getting amazing results. And he's kind of, I would say on the forefront of the people um, that's actually, that are actually doing these surgeries. Um, Cause obviously me and you are not doing that. Right. <laughs> I don't want to cut anyone's tongue open. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I, I, I have heard about that because I have heard about somebody out in Los mm -hmm. Angeles doing it, you know, we're a little bit differently, but yeah, uh, he's yeah. definitely a interesting. I mean, he's a leader in the field for sure at this point, and he's got lots of good information. Um, I'd love to hear him lecture. Um, yeah. But yeah, so you can cool. check him out. <laughs> All right. Well, OK, so let's say somebody is going to work with you either before or after. What's the process like? I mean, you've, you talked a little bit about it, you know, like that you have yeah. before and after and then what what, mm -hmm. what else is there 
if there's any. Yeah, so the interesting thing about me is I don't just work with people who are tongue-tied. Tongue-tie is a part of what I do, but um, I'm also working with people who have um, other symptoms that uh, affect their tongue. So um, a tongue-tie is a physical restriction, you know, a like we said, a midline defect causing the tongue to be in the wrong place. A sure. lot of people I work with have something called a tongue thrust swallowing pattern. Right. And that's developed from usually a breathing problem when you're a kid. Um, you know, you learn to breathe through your mouth, so your tongue drops down and sits in the bottom of your mouth, and it just hangs out there because of a, a learned habit versus a physical problem. So um, right. first of all, I've got to diagnose, you know, what's going on? Why why are they having these problems? The symptoms overlap, whether someone's tongue tied or they have a tongue thrust, those things cross paths quite a bit. So um, the first step I mentioned, I do a free evaluation or free assessment. Um, since I work with people online, it's kind of, you know, I want to do a meet and greet and just let them see who I am and, and see what it's like to work with someone online. The next step from there, I tell people that in order to do like a thorough evaluation, we've got to do a 90 minute appointment where basically I go through, you know, top to bottom, what's happening, um, what are your symptoms, what's your health history, um, and how can I help? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about the patient, but I'm also thinking in my head, what am I going to need to do to help them with these things? So, um, then from there, I typically see people for a 12 session program. Um, for most people, that's what they need. And those 12 sessions can be completed usually between, uh, I would say it's a six to eight month period of time. So um, I meet with people usually every seven to 14 days um, in the beginning. And then the, the meetings taper off towards the end um, more to just make sure that the habits are sticking and you know they've got what they need. Um, their habits have changed and, and that we're both happy with them, the results and where they are. So um, that's how that's how my specific therapy works. Um, you know, there's other myofunctional therapists out there, I'm sure, who've got their own um, ways of doing things. But um, yeah, that's that's what I do. Awesome. Well, can you then share some examples of, of what you teach your clients? Um, sure. Yeah, we can try. So um, I always tell people uh, the very most basic exercise is being able to create a suction. That means sticking your tongue up to the top of your mouth. So actually forming that internal suction with your tongue sticking. You can start, you can get there by making a clicking sound like. Yep. So yeah, you just did it. So sticking that tongue up, if you're tongue tied, it's going to be hard. If you've got a tongue thrust or you're used to breathing through your mouth, it's going to be difficult. Um, but eventually uh, that that skill will will become easier. So I would say that's a basic thing. Um, of course, all the exercises kind of build on each other. So by the end, we're working on things like eating and drinking and head, neck, posture, breathing issues. I, I try to incorporate a lot of different things. Um, I go over a few Buteco breathing techniques. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but another thing that people can look into is um, Buteco breathing. Um, I think the best guy out there is Patrick McEwen. He has lots of books on, um, basically it talks about why it matters um, that we're breathing through our nose and not our mouth. So okay. I'm giving you all these other people to look into. <laughs> yeah, no worries, that's great. I love it. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I hope I answered that question. I think I got on a tangent, but, um, yeah, no, I think that's good. I mean, that, that ultimately is how I show people their, the tongue. Yeah. Tied. Creating the suction. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they just stick their, their tongue straight up. You don't see it really. And then when you do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It, it's similar to what you're saying, like taking the, the finger, like a, like a prong around right. and lifting it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the way, you know, that I can show people and, you know, mm -hmm. they, they can open wider with that then that's generally a better sign. But if they can't definitely they can keep it suck, suctioned up, and, but they mm -hmm. can't really open very wide, then that generally tells me they're fairly tethered. And, and yeah, yeah. And, and it's to me, um, you know, looking at these things from, you know, what, what does the suction matter? Um, being able to create that internal suction inside your mouth, that's the beginning of a swallow. So especially a lot of kids who have very poor muscle control, um, they actually can't, I mean, that's a hard skill, you know, creating that internal suction that, that leads to a proper swallowing pattern with food and saliva and anything that we drink or eat. Um, that to me, it's like a, a building block skill. So um, you've got to be able to create that suction. And and for some people, that's the that's like 
the first step on how they learn to get their tongue in the roof of their mouth is they create that suction while their mouth is closed. Right. Um, my goal is eventually the tongue is strong enough that it doesn't need to be suctioned up in the top of the mouth. Um, but that's where most people start. So it's a it's a good skill to have. It sounds kind of funny, um, yeah. but it's actually really, really important. Right. All right. Well, let's. So that's kind of what people are, you know, I guess an example of people working with you. But what other issues do people work with you for? Um, I would say yeah. dentally. Yeah, dentally people will often, um, usually adults, they'll go to an orthodontist because their teeth have gotten crooked and they they think, gosh, I had braces. You know, why, why have my teeth moved? And so we call this the fancy name for your teeth have moved after you had braces is orthodontic relapse. So a lot of people come to me because... Um, their teeth have shifted. And the dentist, this is when they'll usually say to them, oh, well, that's because you have a tongue thrust. And the patient is like, well, why did no one ever tell me that? <laughs> you know, if I have this tongue thrust thing and it's moving my teeth, why didn't I know about it? So um, that's a reason um, I see orthodontic relapse and actually jaw surgery relapse quite a bit. So the tongue, you know, if it's pushing forward and resting in the wrong place, whether that's because of a tongue thrust or a tongue tie, it's gonna cause um, dental issues. So I would say that's a, a big thing. Um, we already kind of said the sleep apnea, TMJ stuff. Um, but yeah, I would say that's another big, big thing. Or a kid is going through orthodontic treatment and they are working with an orthodontist who's who's been able to say, oh, you have a tongue thrust. I can see it based on the way your, t your occlusion is. So the way your teeth meet together. Um, often people who have a tongue thrust will have something called an open bite or an overbite or overjet. Um, you've probably heard of these things. So that tells me your teeth aren't aligning properly to begin with. So if we put braces on top of that, it's a very unstable situation. You know, it's like building a house on no foundation. If the tongue is down and the mouth is open in a kid that we're trying to move their teeth, um, it, it, it's a flawed, <laughs> it's just a flawed system. So right. I don't know why we don't talk about this or look at it more, but um, that's a big reason um, orthodontists work with me. And honestly, there should be someone like me in every orthodontic office out there. So um, I'm hoping to see my field grow so it gets to that point. But I think we're, we have a ways to go on that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's great. Uh, let me see. I don't know if we yeah. have any more questions. Otherwise, you know. We covered did, a lot of stuff. That's pretty good. I feel like we were pretty thorough, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if people want to learn more about this, uh, I know you have a lot of information on your website. So where do people go yeah. to find out to learn more? You can look up my website. Um, it's myfaceology.com. My practice is called Faceology. Um, I've got a pretty um, interesting YouTube channel. I try to put videos and content out there. Um, you know, I like to get the information out. Lots of people are looking at this stuff, but there's it's hard to find information. So I've got some videos you can watch. Um, I have on Facebook, it's a myofunctional therapy support group. Um, you can join that. I'm posting stuff in there. It's a it's a private group, um, but you can join it and I'm I'm you know posting things in there all the time. Um, but yeah, between my website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel, um, you'll get you'll find a lot of information about tongues. <laughs> Probably more than more than you'll ever, More than you'd ever you imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, gosh, what else, what else can we, can we cover? Is that pretty good? I think that's pretty good. I don't have it. I don't have any questions on the comments where specific to, uh, mm -hmm. tongue ties or anything we didn't cover. So, I mean, if anybody has any other questions like that come up later, you can always post them in the, in the under the comments and we'll try to answer them as we, as we go along. But, Otherwise, yeah. you know, thank you for for having or, or coming on and, and uh, doing this interview with me. I think it's great. Yeah, I, it was really I good. Mm -hmm. felt like it helped a lot and hopefully it brings a lot of clarity to a lot of uh, potential patients and parents and people who yes. who may be looking into this issue and maybe on the fence or just wanting to learn more. Yeah, I think getting this information out there is so important. So I'm happy that you're doing this with me and, you know, hopefully it can reach people, um, you know, the way the internet works, there's information out there. So hopefully it'll reach the people who need it. Yeah, definitely. All right. And then uh, just lastly, for me, if anybody wants to uh, find out more about me, my website is daniellopezdo.com. And otherwise, uh, this has been a great interview. Thank you.
Thanks a lot.